It's, it's so exciting for me to be here. Let's, I interview everyone who uh, won awards with Awana in 1987. Uh, so your That's number... Right. Not just an award, a plaque. A plaque. Forgive me. Just I'll make sure I get that right next time. set the record straight. Yeah. So I want to start because you were... You're, you're a PK. Yeah. You are someone who in many ways was a child of what can be called the sort of church growth movement. And mm -hmm. whatever handle you want to put to it, I like to think that we are now in this time where we are really focused on child discipleship mm -hmm. in this children's ministry community. We don't, we don't want to throw the baby out with the proverbial bathwater. There's mm -hmm. plenty of good things about the church growth movement, but what were some of the fruits that you can identify about your time as a kid versus maybe a better way to ask this would be child discipleship back then. Child discipleship has been a part of your entire life. What was child discipleship look like back then when you were a kid? And what does child discipleship look like now for you as a dad? Yeah, I mean, I, I, my parents were both first century, I'm sorry, first century, both first, <laughs> a little tired after yeah, preaching yeah, yeah, on sure, West sure, Coast sure. time. We're both first generation followers of Jesus. And, uh, you know, classic, my dad was playing in a rock band in California in the mm -hmm. 1960s, 70s. And his girlfriend invited him to a Billy Graham crusade, sure. and he went. I mean, the, the whole thing, and ended up as a pastor. And so I think for them, they made a conscious decision early on to prioritize parenting over pastoring, and uh, which sadly you kind of have to do in a lot of church cultures. And so they made some real sacrificial decisions, um, including stepping down from a pastoral role at a very prestigious church to take a, a smaller a smaller role uh, in order to really devote more time. And so I'm really grateful like to Awana, but also to my parents and the time they invested in me. Like my parents recently just moved and when they were going through all of their things, my mom found the little three by five card box that she used to, you know, do all my Awana scripture memory with for sure. me. Sure. And she let me look at it and I was just thinking, it was big. And they were all these handwritten scriptures from my mom. And I was just thinking the time it would have taken her <laughs> to sit down and write all these out and then sit with me and yeah. like do the memory of the flashcards with me or whatever. And I'm just thinking the time that she must have devoted to, you know, taking me through this curriculum for Christ, this, this discipleship program, you know, was just staggering. And so in many ways, I'm grateful for some of what my parents and that discipleship model built into my life a fierce love and devotion to the reading of scripture mm -hmm. and uh, devotion to church on Sunday, to financial generosity, to prayer. And I was able to take that foundation and then build on it, you know, mm -hmm. as the next generation, second kind of generation followers of Jesus. I'm the oldest of four. We're all following Jesus. Um, and uh, and that was a real gift. And so I was able to realize that there was a lot about that model of discipleship that was lacking. Yeah. Like it was lacking, I think, a holistic body brace, body based, emotionally informed approach to just spiritual life in general and discipleship. Yeah. But uh, that's not an angry reaction. I was able to take all of that stuff that's still very much in my my life with God and just grow and kind of take some more ancient practices and more holistic understandings of discipleship and kind of add that to that foundation. So with my kids, it's a lot of the similar things. I don't think I'm actually doing as good of a job as my parents are, did, <laughs> but it's a lot of the same kind of things, you know, of scripture in the morning and church. Then with the addition of practices like Sabbath and yeah. that's been a major thing that wasn't much in my life as a kid that now is like an anchor for our spirituality and life in community, you know what I mean? Um, that was an era where where people were maybe a little bit more social because they weren't online, but deep community was rare, at least in the culture I grew up in. So kind of raising my kids in a multi-generational, we call it a kinship group, but kind of this blending of family and community and people. So I think those are the two primary things I've been trying to add to my children's experience of childhood discipleship is kind of a more holistic approach to discipleship that incorporates disciplines like Sabbath and deep life in community. Sure. One of the things that stands out to me, and this is true for you, and this is true for a lot of you, is this, and you even said this when, with what you just shared at the forum, you're someone who has all of these thoughts of like, you know the things to do, right? They are in your head of like, yeah. these are the things Only I should do. Only it was that easy. Right, exactly. And folks who are watching, like they know the things to do, but you have to take these thoughts and figure out how to apply them to these little people who are in your life, I who are know. walking around and they have some of your faults and you see them, right? 
And I'm curious. They, they have, just to clarify, they have most of my faults. <laughs> Fair. And they've uh, and in my wife's too, so yes, they've just I appreciate, double. I appreciate that fact check. That was an important <laughs> fact check for you. Um, but what I'm curious about for you is like, when you have to walk through that work, I think a lot of people go, "I have to apply this to my kids," and they make it overcomplicated. Mm -hmm. And what I what you in that story you shared about your mom, it's about just writing that out on the note card and letting yeah. God do the lifting. Yeah. What have you found to be effective with your kids? And when you realize you're sort of making it more complicated, how do you get back on track? Oh, man, I, I feel like you're asking expert questions, and I am far from an expert. You know, I, I think mo like most parents, I just feel like I'm stumbling my way through this thing, you know? Yeah, but I think so many parents love to fire the shame cannon at their, their selves. Yes, and I think I'm one of those parents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Overall in life, I don't struggle with shame. I just feel such a sense of the love of God for me. But sometimes as a parent, I just... It just exposes all of your weaknesses. All your insecurities. Your, you know, it's, there's this weird conspiracy of grace. One of the things I just want to face-to-face ask God about where in our, you know, we treat the people we love the most the worst because the people that we're closest to, we feel most safe with, so our kind of unedited self comes out with most. So I love my wife and my children more than anyone else, and I want to love them and treat them better than anyone else, and yet they get the worst of me. Hmm. My coworkers get a much godlier version of me. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because I'm with them for a two-hour Zoom call. I, right. I, can be, I can be really patient and gracious, and even if they did something super annoying, I can be like, that's okay. When everyone like, I'm thinking, that's not okay. But when it's sure. like... 9.45 at night yeah. or 10.30 and I'm trying to go to bed and my teenager is playing some song I told him not to listen to in his room loud right. and he's arguing. I'm not that, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like, that's okay. Yeah. It's just like, Let's turn off your music, you know? <laughs> um, so there's this conspiracy of grace where I, I don't think there's a way to parent without having to confront your own weakness as a mm -hmm. disciple of Jesus, your own malformation, your own brokenness. Um, both in your children and then the, humi the, the, the humbling that comes when you see it pass down the family line. And so I, I do think there's a conspiracy of grace in that. And perfectionism and parenting do not pair well at yeah. all. Perfectionism pairs well with like modern architecture, not with parenting, you know what I mean? Or like <laughs> sure. graphic design yeah, 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 or yeah. like there are certain things you can just get it perfect. Yeah. But parenting is not one of mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. It is earthy, it is messy, it is on the fly, you know? So I think for me, it's, tri it's a long way of saying it. it's trial and error, and I'm not trying to dodge the question. And my children are wonderful, but uh, I, I do think we are learning as we go. And so for us, a lot of it's been about habits and community. Yeah. How do we build a habit structure, little micro you know, expressions of what would be called spiritual disciplines, mm -hmm. build that into the life of our children? Like, you know, my parents had that, they called it the no Bible, no breakfast rule. Like we had to read scripture before we could eat. <laughs> I've had a chance to talk to your parents and yes. I've thought about that ever since ever. I interviewed them. And yeah. most people are like, that's spiritual abuse. That's <laughs> whatever. Maybe it is. All I know is I am 42 years old. I'm the oldest of four and all four of us kids wake up and the first thing we do every <laughs> morning is we read scripture. Yeah. And for us, we did not experience it. And uh, we have no like trauma. I don't think we talked to our therapists about that. Yep. The other things we talked to our therapists about, but not Amen. that one. Yep. And it just, that was, that was habituating that into my body. And so it's, it's, as, it's things like that. Um, you know, and habituating aspects into your children. And then really just to circle back to community, like really trying, I was really struck when, you know, Barna did that uh, wide ranging kind of millennial spirituality survey a few years ago, and their conclusion that the num their, you know, what, what makes a child stay a follower of Jesus into mm -hmm. adulthood. The, the thing that was not intuitive for me that I would not have even guessed if I were to take a hypothesis, it would not have even made it under the whiteboard, was it seemed to be that their primary unifying factor was multi-generational relationships. Yeah. Does a child growing up in the church have deep friendships and relationships with people outside of their family and in who are generations ahead of them? Yeah. And I think we really took that to heart and immediately invited the 70-year-old couple into our kind of table community that we do life with and trying to raise them in a multi-ethnic, multi-generational blending of family and community where they're growing up and they have friendships with mm -hmm. people that aren't just their parents or grandparents, but beyond that. That for us, I think we've taken really seriously to heart. I think there's a lot of parenting and childhood discipleship things I've really not done a great job with. That's one I think like we've done that yeah. well. We Sabbath well, we live in community well, and we build a couple of habits in 
and maybe that's all we have to do. No, <laughs> that's all and, we have to offer. You but know, honestly, but. I do think that does cover so much of it because God does so much of this, and we Through make it so space. complicated. Yeah. Exactly, because I think you know we use the language loving, caring adult, right? And you by providing that intergenerational discipleship, you are providing folks in your kid's life who even just through, this is probably not even the right theological language, so I'm going to apologize in advance, right? See God slightly differently than you. Yes. And can give your kids a, a more robust picture of all that he is. And especially like, you know, I'm thinking of my oldest son, who's just, who's wonderful, but who's very different from me just by personality. Sure. And so it's really difficult to parent children that are just wired up. So like he's wired up so differently. The things that I would never do in a million years, he does with the palm, good and <laughs> sure, bad. Sure, sure, sure. And the things that I would just, of, co of course I would do that. He would think, why would you do that, you know? And so his motivation structure, his inner architecture, his emotional kind of way of being in the world are so different from mine. And so there's only so much of my spirituality that can, I can hand to him. I have a second son who's not a clone of me, but he's much more like me. Yeah. And it's much, much easier for me to kind of help him develop a relationship with Jesus because we're wired similar. Right. My oldest son, we're wired so different that he's probably going, his pathway to God is probably going to be very different to my pathway to God. There'll be similarities, be a lot of differences. So to have people in his life that are more like him and less like me, but who are farther down the path is not just a good idea. It is, I think, of life or death importance for his spiritual future. And, you know, just at a secular developmental psychology level, all the expert, all the research shows that children, in particular boys, go through a primary emotional attachment from mom to dad to mentor. Hmm. And so I think parents need to plan for that, need to not take it personally. You never outgrow your need for a mother or a father. But most little kids primarily emotionally orient to their mom. And when they stub their toe, they're likely to run to mom. And hmm. every family's different, every child's different, there's yeah. gender stuff. And then, then that, there's a shift, you know, for most kids, it's around age or not, eight or nine, but it's different stages, not ages, to dad in a healthy kind of family structure. And then right around my oldest son's age, about 16, 15, 16, 17, there's a shift from dad to mentor. Hmm. And you still want to be present to them as mom and dad. You still want to be walk with them through all of life, but they will need that. So I think the earlier we can plan for that as yeah. parents, and again, trying to have mentors and fathers involved from day one, but planning for this progression and trying to curate that in a sense. So there are options for boys in particular, but children to be mentored by multi-generational followers of Jesus. Oh man, there's about six hours there. But to, to begin to land the plane, one of the things that strikes me about your new ministry, Practicing the Way, yeah. is that it's practicing the way. Yeah. And one of the things that scares me the most about my kids being seven, almost seven and three, is that they're gonna be, they're entering an environment where discipleship, as you shared, is treated as, at best, a way, yeah. right? Let alone the way. Yes. How do we begin to understand, because I think you share in talking about a curriculum for Christ-likeness, how do we begin to show kids that Jesus is the way, not just a way in a, uh, a marketplace of options yes. towards life to the full? Well, I mean, gosh, I don't know how to answer that. That would be a better question to ask Rebecca. But <laughs> I do think that there's a pivot that parents cannot be behind the learning curve on to where the culture has shifted so dramatically that, you know, when I was growing up, even though I was growing up in California in the 80s and 90s, it was still secular and, you know, moderately liberal. But it was pretty calm and chill. It wasn't angry and hostile like it is today for the most part. And you could still kind of fudge it to where if you were a really good Christian, you could be well-respected and liked mm. by non-Christians. That world is gone, in particular because of human sexuality. So now, no matter how kind you are, thoughtful you are, intelligent you are, generous you are, educated you are, fill in your you know, cultural preference, you will be perceived as not just an odd person, like it was when I was growing up, you're weird, but as an immoral person or a bigot or as mm. a demented person, as a danger, as a sure. threat. So when I was growing up, when I was going through high school in the 90s, as a follower of Jesus, surrendering my sexuality to Jesus, I was just weird. But it was kind of like mildly respected. Like, you're weird. I don't know why you're not sleeping with your girlfriend, but I kind of respect that. Sure. Now you're not weird. You're a threat mm. to equality and justice as it's, I think, misunderstood right now or understood. So I think our children are growing up in a world that's much more hostile. Now, this would be a lot more true in Portland, where we've spent the last 20 years, or California, than in 
Franklin, Tennessee. Sure. Um, but still, the internet is ahead of most cultures. So what's deceptive for parents living in cultural, more culturally conservative contexts is that they don't realize their children are primarily living online, not in the real world. And online is closer to Portland. Yeah. Franklin might be 30 years behind Portland on the secularization curve, but the internet is just like five years behind, you yeah. know? Yeah. And so I have this experience when I travel through the South, and again, I'm from this super secular, super liberal, super hostile, you know, place. Um, so that's the world I live in. It's like coming from, you know, I don't know, parts of Europe or Scandinavia. But uh, I have this phenomenon when I travel through the South, and I'll talk to pastors, and we'll, I'll talk about post-Christian culture and hostility, and most older pastors who tend to be the senior leaders at churches will often push back live in Q&A and say, it's not like that down here, and that sounds like really hard where you're at, but that's not our problem, da 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 and, and they're right. Yeah. But then all their youth pastors come up to me afterwards, <laughs> and I'll talk to the 24-year-old, 25, 26, and they will very respectfully say, they don't think it is here. It's 100% here in anybody yeah. under 25. Yeah. It's come through their phones, and around you it still looks like mm -hmm. it did culturally a while ago and there's an older generation that is still living in that cultural social imaginary but for those under 25 or whatever the age is it's it's significantly been secularized so i think the sooner that parents it's a long way of saying the sooner the parents can wake up to that reality and be super like woke to digital deconstructionism like what yeah. the internet is doing to people and the power dynamics there that are ruining the lives of our children and recognize that we have to raise kids with a minority mentality, with a, with a loving alternative community mentality. So if you're a Hasidic Jew in Brooklyn, you know that you're raising your children radically different than the surrounding culture. They're yeah. gonna look different, they're gonna dress different, they're gonna, if you are a, a practicing Muslim living in LA, you know mm -hmm. that you are raising your kids in a radically alternative culture to the wider one. The problem is if you are a, a Christian parent in Franklin, you probably aren't thinking that way about raising your children, and yeah. you need to. You need to think, if, if I was an Orthodox Jew in New York City, or if I, how, how would I be thinking about building uh, a mindset in these kids where we want to love the host culture, bless the host culture, but this host culture is not our culture. We belong to another kingdom. We belong to another king. We are an alternative society. We are a counter contrast community to the host culture of America or wherever you call home. And raising children in that mindset. So you first have to have that mindset. A lot of parents don't. You have to get that mindset and then you have to build a habit structure, life architecture, and then you have to build a community that is stronger than the host culture. You know, it's the whole Bonhoeffer. I got this from my friend John Tyson, but you know, Bonhoeffer went out to Finkenwald, if you know his story mm -hmm. during the kind of Nazi regime to build this kind of, you know, monastic kind of alternative seminary for true pastors that wanted to not be corrupted by the, you know, the national church that had completely gone over to the Nazis. And Bonhoeffer came from money and privilege and was uh, educated. And so he was expected to like become a well-respected, you know, professor in Berlin. And so they basically sent a family friend out to basically talk sense into him and say, what are you giving your life? You're out here in like the middle of what's now Poland doing this like underground seminary, doing rule of life and then like, what are you doing? Come back and like get married and have a reasonable upstanding yeah. upper class job in life, you know, come be a professor. And he just quietly said, come with me. And they got in this rowboat. And as the story goes, they rowed across the lake that Finkenwald was like, there was a hill on the other side. They hiked up to the top of the hill. And apparently on the other side was a, was a Nazi military base, planes coming and going. And there was a Hitler youth camp there. And there were all these Hitler youth marching. And he just pointed across the lake at Finkenwald, the seminary, and said, this must be stronger than that. And I think we need to think that way. Yeah. This, our discipleship, must be stronger than that. Yeah. The internet, the Portlands of the world, secularism, all the postmodern stuff going on. Our community has to be stronger. And so how do we build? Not, it's not, you cannot think nuclear family. You have to think church, and I don't mean like congregational Sunday, I mean like community of yep. Jesus, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, thick webbing, not just church and small group, like you are doing life with the community of followers of Jesus. You have to think, how do we build a community and a habit structure that, and a worldview that is stronger than the one that we're surrounded in? Amen to that, and you're doing that 
and you're doing that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you yeah, for your wisdom. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. And uh, we're going to let you go, but thank Great. you again for all that you shared. Thanks for today. having me. Yeah. Really a joy.